A Christmas Carol in prose being a ghost story of Christmas, abridged by Charles Dickens. Stave one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead. To begin with, old Marley was as dead as a doornail. This must be understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. Well, Joanne and I are going to relate it. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, though his old partner was definitely dead. The company was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, Scrooge was a selfish old sinner, and he didn't thaw one degree at Christmas. One dark Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was biting, foggy weather. Scrooge had a very small fire, but his clerk's poor fire was barely warm. Merry Christmas, Uncle! Scrooge's nephew came into the room. Bah, said Scrooge, humbug. Christmas a humbug, uncle, he said. You don't mean that. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holy holly through his heart. The nephew answered, don't be angry, Uncle. Come for Christmas tomorrow. Bah, humbug. Why cannot we be friends, cried Scrooge's nephew. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Goodbye, said Scrooge. His nephew even stopped to wish Merry Christmas to the clerk outside. My clerk, muttered Scrooge, 15 shillings a week and a wife and a family talking about Merry Christmas. Humbug! Scrooge's nephew had let two other people in. They bowed to him. Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley, said one of the gentlemen. Mr. Marley, Scrooge replied, died seven years ago this very night. Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, a few of us are going to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. What would you like to give? Nothing, said Scrooge. They can go to the debtor's prison. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Scrooge went back to work. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness and biting cold thickened. One cold young boy stopped, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to sing a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of, God bless ye merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Scrooge jumped up so that the singer fled in terror and leaving the keyhole to the fog. At length, the hour of shutting up arrived. Scrooge nodded to the clerk, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll all want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. The clerk observed that it was only once a year, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge. Be here all the earlier next morning. Scrooge went home to his gloomy house. The yard was dark and the fog and frost hung about the house. Now the knocker on his door was very large and ordinary. But tonight, it looked like Marley's face. Marley's face, the eyes wide open, and its grayish color made it horrible. As Scrooge looked, it became a knocker again. 
He did look carefully, but there was nothing behind the door. So he said, pooh, pooh, and closed it with a bang. He closed his door and double locked himself in. He walked through his rooms to see that all was right and sat by the fire. Humbug, he said, and then he heard it, a clanking noise from the cellar, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound. Boom! And then he heard the noise coming up the stairs, then straight towards the door. Humbug, said Scrooge. It came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Marley, the chain Marley pulled was long and made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and purses. His body was transparent so that Scrooge could see the two buttons on his coat behind. What do you want with me? said Scrooge. Who are you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Humbug! I tell you, humbug! At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry, and it shook its chain. Scrooge fell upon his knees, asked the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must, but why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. You are chained, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, pursed the ghost, pursued the ghost. Your chain was as heavy as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have made it longer since then, but you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. Kindness was my business. I am here tonight to warn you, pursued the ghost. You will be haunted by three spirits. I, I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. The spectra floated out behind the bleak, dark night. Expect the first tomorrow, said the ghost, when the bells tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same door. The third upon the next night at the last stroke of twelve. When it had said these words, the specter floated out upon the bleak, dark night. The air was filled with moaning phantoms, and every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. They faded away. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was still as he had double-locked it with his own hands. He tried to say, humbug, but stopped. And he went straight to bed and fell asleep upon an instant. Stave two, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was dark. The chimes of a neighboring church struck the hour with a deep, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room, and the curtains of his beds were drawn aside. I tell you, by a hand. And Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close as I am now to you. It was a strange figure, like a child or an old man. Its white hair hung about its neck and down its back. And yet the face 
had not a wrinkle in it. Its legs and feet were bare. It wore a white tunic with a shining belt. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand and had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. Are you the spirit who's come? I'd like to do that over. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me, said Scrooge. The voice was soft and gentle. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past, inquired Scrooge. No, your past. It put out its strong hand and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. They passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road. Now it was clear, cold, winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heavens, said Scrooge. I was a boy in this place. He wiped away a tear and begged the ghost to lead him. You recollect the way, said the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge. I could walk it blindfolded. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and tree until a little town appeared in the distance. Some shaggy ponies trotted towards them with boys upon their backs. All these boys shouted to each other merrily. Scrooge knew and named them every one. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They do not see us. But why was he filled with gladness when he heard them tell each other Merry Christmas as they parted? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A lonely child neglected by his friends is, still, is there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he cried. They soon approached a large house, its windows broken, and the many rooms cold and bare of food. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, to the back of the house in a room with desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down beside his poor forgotten self as he used to be, he said, poor boy, and cried again. I wish, Scrooge muttered after drying his eyes with his cuff, but it's too late now. What is the matter, asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. And there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the holidays. The door opened, and a little girl came darting in and put her arms around his neck. I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child. We're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. Your sister, said the ghost, always a delicate creature, but she had a large heart. So she, she had, so she had, cried Scrooge. You're right, spirit. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, I think, one child. Your nephew, Scrooge answered sadly, yes. All at once, they were in a busy city. Here, too, it was Christmas time again, but it was evening, and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. At sight at the sight of an old gentleman behind a high desk, Scrooge cried in great excitement, Why, bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Scrooge's former self 
Now a young man came in beside his fellow apprentice. Old Fezziwick laid down his pen and looked up at the clock. He rubbed his hands, called out in a rich voice, No more work tonight, my boys, said Fezziwig. Christmas Eve, Dick, Christmas Embernezer. Clear away, lads. It, it was done in a minute. The floor <laughs> swept was swept, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped <laughs> upon the fire, and the warehouse became a snug, warm, and bright ballroom. Scrooge is taken to the warehouse of a beloved farmer employer just in time to witness a Christmas dance that occurred when he was young. In came a fiddler with a music book. In came Mrs. Fezziwick and the three Miss Fezziwigs. In came all the young men and women employed in the business, the housemaid, the baker, the cook, the milkman. Away they all went, 20 couples at once. There were dances and games and there was a cake and roast beef and mince pies and plenty of ale. During all this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. He enjoyed everything. Now that he remembered the ghost, he became conscious that it was looking full upon him. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to make our work a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He stopped. What is the matter, asked the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. Scrooge and the ghost again stood in the open door. My time grows short, observed the spirit, quick. Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now. He was not alone, but sat by a pretty young girl. In her eyes, there were tears. It matters little to you, she said softly. Another idol has taken my place. It is the love of money. Goodbye. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit! cried Scrooge. Show me no more. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. He was conscious of being exhausted and of being in his own bedroom. He had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Stay three, the second of the three spirits. Scrooge waited again. Now when the bell struck one, he saw a ghostly light coming from the next room. He shuffled to the door. A strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. The room was hung with holly and mistletoe, and a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney. Heaped up like a throne were geese, Pies, plum puddings, chestnuts, oranges, pears, cakes, and punch. Upon his food coach there sat a jolly giant who held a glowing torch high up to shed its light on Scrooge. The spirit of Christmas present bid Scrooge to enjoy the holiday. Come in, explained the ghost, and know me better, man. Scrooge entered and hung his head. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in a green robe, bordered with white fur. Its feet were bare, and on its head wore a holly wreath. Sat there, here and there, with a shiny icicles. You have never seen the like of me before, explained the spirit. Spirit, said Scrooge, conduct me where you will. 
I went forth last night and I learned a lesson which is working now, tonight. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, feast, fire, room, all vanished instantly. And they stood in the city streets on a snowy Christmas morning. The sky was gloomy, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad like a summer day. Soon the steeples called the people to church, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their happiest faces. The good spirit led him straight to Scrooge's clerks, holding his robe, and at the door the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling. Think of that! Bob had but 15 shillings a week himself, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his little house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, dressed poorly in a worn dress. What has ever got your precious father then? said Mrs. Cratchit to the little Cratchits. And your brother, Tiny Tim. In came Bob, the father, in his threadbare clothes and Tiny Tim upon his shoulders. Sadly, Tiny Tim held a little crutch. And how did little Tim behave? said Mrs. Cratchit. As good as gold, said Bob. He told me that he hoped the people saw him in church because he was crippled, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Mrs. Cratchit brought in the pudding like a speckled cannonball blazing with brandy and with Christmas holly stuck on the top. A wonderful pudding. Bob proposed the toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded the night that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the corner in a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, he will die this year, repeated the ghost. What then? If he'd like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head, ashamed to hear his own words. Man, said the ghost, you will decide what men shall live, what men shall die. It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. But now Scrooge heard his own name. Mr. Scrooge, toasted Bob, I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, said Miss Cratchit. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party. By and by, they had a song from Tiny Tim, who had a sweet little voice and sang it very well indeed. They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed, but they were happy, 
grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with time. Scrooge watched them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. And now they traveled through coal miners' homes, past ships on dark seas, and everywhere they went, no matter how poor, every person hummed a Christmas tune or had a Christmas thought. And every person, good or bad, had a kind word for another on that day. Scrooge heard a hearty laugh and recognized it as his own nephew's. He found himself in a bright, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side. Ha ha, laughed Scrooge's nephew. He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. He believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's voice indignantly. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I am sorry for him. Who suffers by his ill wilms? Himself, always. They had some music and played at games, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas. They all played and sang, and so did Scrooge, singing quite loud. He begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this, the spirit, could not be done. Much they saw, and far they went, and everywhere the spirit, he left his blessing. It was a long night, and Scrooge noticed that the, get, the ghost grew older, and he noticed that its hair was gray. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The bell struck twelve, and the spirit disappeared. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Molly, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist upon the ground towards him. Stave four, the last of the spirits. The phantom approached in a deep black garment, which left nothing of it visible save one bony hand. I am the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, said Scrooge. You are about to show me shadows of the things that will happen. Is that so, spirit? Scrooge's legs trembled beneath him. Ghost of the future, he ex explained, ex exclaimed. I fear you more than any specter I have seen, but I know your purpose is to do me good and I'm prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand pointed straight ahead. Lead on, said Scrooge, lead on. The night is precious time to me. I know, lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away. They were in the heart of the city amongst the merchants who hurried up and down and chinked the money in their pockets. As Scrooge had seen them often, the spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, pointed to them. Scrooge advanced to listen to this talk. No, said a great fat man, a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin yawning. It's likely he, to be a very cheap funeral, for I don't know anybody who would go to it. I don't mind going if lunch is provided, 
<laughs> Last one, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. Scrooge fancied that the unseen eyes were looking at him closely. It made him shudder and feel very cold. They went into a dirty part of town where the shops and houses reeked with filth and misery. There was a shop where greasy junk was brought. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the shop of Old Joe's, just as two women and a man carried in bundles laughing. <laughs> <laughs> the man produced his plunder first. A pencil case and a brooch were, were all. Old Joe added to his prices upon the wall. And I know those things, Scrooge said. They are just like mine, and they are worth much more than this man is paying. Who's next, said Joe. Mrs. Dibbler was next, sheets and towels, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. I paid two shillings, ten for teaspoons, just like those, Scrooge objected. And now undo my bundle, Joe, said the next woman. Joe dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff, the same fabric and color as Scrooge's bed curtains. Bed curtains, said Joe. You don't mean to say you took him down, rings and all, with him lying there dead. Yes, I do, replied the woman. Why not? His blankets, too, asked Joe. Who else do you think, replied the woman. And that's the best shirt he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me, putting it on him to be buried in... Ha, 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 she laughed, but I took it off again. Scrooge looked at a shirt, just like his own shirt, and listened in horror. Ha, 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 laughed the same woman <laughs> when old Joe paid the three out. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from head to foot. I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed a bare, uncurtained bed on which beneath a ragged sheet there lay the body of a man. He lay in the dark, empty house with no one to say that he was kind to me in this or that. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. Let us go. The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Very quiet, the little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, with Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were sewing, but surely they were very quiet. The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. It must be past your father's bedtime, she said. Peter said, shutting his book, but I think he has walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. At last, she said, he used to walk with tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed, but he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so. Ah, oh, there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him. Bob broke down all at once and cried. He couldn't help it. They drew about the fire and talked. 
Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once. I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and sorry for your good wife. I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we? Never, father cried. They all cried. Spectre, said Scrooge, tell me what that man was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come did not answer, but led him straight on until they reached an iron gate. A churchyard? Here, then, the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. Scrooge is shown his own neglected grave. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Answer me one question, said Scrooge. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? He followed the finger and read upon the stone of the grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit, oh, no, no. The finger still was there. Spirit, he cried, tightly clutching to his robe. Hear me, I am not the man I was. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me, I may sponge away the writing on the stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand, the phantom's hood and dress shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Stave five, the end of it. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. His face was wet with tears. They are not torn down, cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. They are not torn down, rings and all. They are here. I am here. The shadows of things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will be. I don't know what to do, cried Scrooge, laughing, crying in the same breath. I am as light as a feather. I am as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. Uh, I'm giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everybody. A happy new year to all the world. He had frisked into the sitting room and was now standing there perfectly winded. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered, cried Scrooge, starting off again and going round the fireplace. There's the corner where the ghost of present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> <laughs> really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh. 
I don't know what day of the month it is, said Scrooge. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind. I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. The churches began ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Clash, clang, hammer, ding, dong, bell. Oh, glorious, glorious. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright gold. Golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. What's today's, cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes. Eh, returned the boy. What's today, my fine fellow, said Scrooge. Today, replied the boy. Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the poultry shop in the next street at the corner? Scrooge inquired. I should hope I did, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging there? Not the little prize turkey, but the big one. <laughs> what? The one as big as me? returned the boy. What a delightful boy. Yes, yes. It's hanging there now, said the boy. Is it? Go and buy it. What? exclaimed the boy. I am in earnest. Go and tell them to bring it here that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with man and I will give him a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. He wrote the address somehow and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there waiting his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. I shall love it as long as I live, cried Scrooge, patting it on his hand. It's a wonderful knocker. Here's the turkey. Here you are. Merry Christmas. It was a turkey. Gobble, gobble. Why, it's impossible that to Camden Town, said Scrooge, you must have a cab. The chuckle with which he has said this, and the chuckle with which he had paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he had paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he had recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again, <laughs> and chuckled until he cried. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. Three or four good-humored fellows, good morning, sir, a merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the happy sounds he had ever heard, those were the happiest in his ears. He had not gone far when coming on towards him, he beheld the gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before. He sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what paid, what path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both his hands. How do you do? 
I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness to allow me to give you... Here, Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord, bless me, cried the gentleman as if his breath were taken away. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you would please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it. I will assure you, will you do me a favor? My dear sir, said the other one, shaking his hands, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything, please, retorted Scrooge. Will you come and see? I will, cried the old gentleman, and it was clear he meant to do it. Thank ye, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to the church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? said Scrooge. He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll, I'll show you upstairs, if you please. He knows me, said Scrooge and with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred, said Scrooge. Why, bless my soul, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. It was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in to the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. He was on the stool in a jiffy driving away with his pen as if he was trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was ma making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, and therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. Bob trembled. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help in a straight waistcoat. Scrooge and Bob Cratchit discussing Bob's future over a hot drink. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge with his er e e earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merry Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, that I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon. Bob, make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another. I, Bob Cratchit. 
Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh. In his heart, in his own heart, he laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further meetings with spirits ever afterwards, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, may that be truly said of us and all of us. And so as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Everyone. Yay! Oh, God yama. bless us, us. Yeah. everyone. And let's all celebrate the spirit of Christmas because that's what it's all about. And Merry Christmas to you. And Happy Holidays, however you choose to celebrate your holidays. And make love be the spirit oh, that I, shines. Oh, I like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Oh.